was talking to Father Miles Walsh, who I want to thank for inviting me to come and speak to you today. I said, so what would you like me to talk about? Something new, something fresh, something I haven't worked on? He said, no, 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 I want you to talk about the Eucharist. Because this is the source and the summit of our lives as Christians. That's what the church teaches. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1324, it says, the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. So if we're going to spend the day reflecting on our spiritual lives and on the spiritual battle we are engaged in as men, we want to go straight to the the source and start right at the beginning with Christ himself present to us in the Eucharist. So the title of this morning's presentation is The Eucharist and Spiritual Battle. And what I'm going to be doing this morning is taking some of the material from my book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, and walking through it with you, looking at two key questions. Number one, what are the biblical foundations for our belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? Like, why do we as Catholics believe that when the priest says the words, this is my body and this is my blood, that it really is changed, the bread and wine really are changed, transubstantiated into the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ? Where do we get that from? And secondly, the second question I want to ask is, what are the implications for the truth of Jesus' real presence for our spiritual lives, in particular as men, and especially I'm going to be also making points about fatherhood as well, right? What does it mean for us to believe in the Eucharist as men in Christ and as fathers engaged in spiritual battle, in spiritual warfare with the devil, with the enemies of our spiritual life, the fallen powers of this present darkness, as well as just the temptations of the world and the struggles of life? And what I hope that you'll see is by looking at the Eucharist through a new lens, primarily through the lens of the Old Testament, we're going to shed new light on what this great gift means to us in our lives. So, without any further ado, let's just begin with a brief prayer and ask the Lord's help. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for this amazing display of love for you and for our mother, our Lady of Lords, and all these brothers in Christ that have shown up today. I pray that in a special way as we turn our hearts and our minds to begin this day of reflection and prayer on the mystery of the Eucharist, that you would send the Holy Spirit upon us and among us to open our minds and to open our hearts to everything that you want to show us in your word. We ask all this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Lords, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, it's good to be back here at Sacred Heart. If you've heard me spoke before, speak before, you know that um, I love to talk about the Old Testament in particular. So what we're going to be doing this morning is looking at the Eucharist through the lens of the Old Testament. And I want to highlight three key prefigurations, three key events in the Old Testament that point forward to the fulfillment of the Eucharist in the New Testament. And those three things are these. Number one, the ancient Jewish Passover lamb. Number two the ancient and mysterious manna from heaven, and then number three, one of my favorite of all, the mysterious Ark of the Covenant. And what we'll see is, as we walk through the biblical narratives of each one of these items, the manna, the Ark, the Passover lamb, we're going to see that God has had a plan to give us the great mystery of the Eucharist that goes all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the beginnings of salvation history. That the Eucharist is not just something that the Catholic Church made up in the wake of Jesus' death, but it's part of God's divine plan of salvation. And it's part of his plan for your life in particular, your spiritual life, your spiritual growth, and your role as a man in Christ who's called by Christ to do spiritual battle in this world, in this world of temptation and sin. So we'll begin by just a couple of quick principles here before we get started. If you look in your, uh, your booklets there, I have a couple of quotes from the Catechism that give you insight into the way I'm going to be approaching the Old Testament. The first point regards what's called typology. The way I'm going to be looking at the Old Testament over the course of this presentation is this— 
that in the Old Testament, there are prefigurations of New Testament fulfillment. In other words, there are events and realities that are like signs and shadows that point forward to what Christ is going to do in the Old Testament, and in, I'm sorry, in the New Testament and in the church. So if you really want to understand Catholicism, you always, always, always don't go back just to the New Testament. You have to go back to the Old Testament and do a typological reading of the scriptures. And when you will do that, what you're going to discover is what St. Augustine said in that second quote there, that the New Testament, our New Testament faith, our Catholic faith, is actually hidden in the Old, and that the Old Testament is revealed in the New. And over the course of the last 13 years or so, one of the things that's been the most exciting opportunity for me in teaching is just showing Catholics over and over again that some of the most uh, difficult and, uh, and sometimes strange things that we believe as Catholics, like a man giving us his body and his blood under the appearance of bread and wine, can only be really understood if you go back to Judaism, if you go back to the Old Testament, and in particular if you go back to the story of the Exodus from Egypt. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to look at these Jewish roots of the Eucharist and our spiritual life, beginning with the first and most important sign of the Eucharist in the Old Testament, which is the Passover. So let's begin with part one there, the new Passover. Um, if you go back to the Old Testament and you study the story of salvation, in particular the story of the Exodus, what you will see, and you'll probably recall this from the story of Moses and the Israelites in Egypt, is that when God sends Moses to deliver his people from bondage to slavery to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, he begins by giving a series of plagues, right? There's a, the turning of the river Nile into blood. There's the plague of frogs. There's a the plague of flies. There's a the plague of darkness. And he has all these different plagues, ten plagues in particular. But none of them actually ever get Pharaoh to finally release his people. The final plague, however, the tenth and final plague, the one that actually sets them free from slavery, is the plague of the Passover night. And when that Passover night comes, God gives certain commands to his people Israel. And he says to them that on that night of the Passover, the destroying angel, the angel of death, is going to pass over the land of Egypt. And every firstborn son is going to die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh all the way down to the firstborn of the lowliest servant. But he says for his people, he's going to protect them from the plague of death by going through a particular ritual. The ritual of the Passover sacrifice. So let's look at that for just a moment on your uh, handouts there. The old Passover, what did that entail? Well, notice the whole thing was about protecting your family from death. How did you do that in the Old Testament? This is how you did it. Listen to the words. Quote, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb, According to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. And then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted, with unleavened bread, and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now, in this manner you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And the Hebrew word there is Pesach, and the Greek word is Pascha. We get the word Paschal mystery from that. I'll come back to that later on in the presentation. Why is it called the Passover? Well, God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Now, notice a couple of things about this description of the Passover sacrifice. The first point I want to highlight there, I've tried to italicize them, is this. That at this time in Israel's history, there wasn't yet a Levitical priesthood that was established. 
So most of us, if we think about the Old Testament priests, we think about the Levites that were one of the 12 tribes that were called and set apart to function in the tabernacle, to offer the sacrifices, to offer the blood, to offer the bread on the altars. But at this point, before the Levites were set up in Exodus 32, there was something different going on. At this point in the story, all 12 tribes of Israel were called to be priests. And each father would actually act as a kind of priest over his household. So when it says that each man would take a lamb and sacrifice it, what it means is that the father of the family is in a sense going to function as the priest over his own family. So he's going to take the lamb on the 10th day of the month, and then he's going to keep it for four days, just long enough for the kids to get attached to it. And then he's going to slit its throat, right? No, it's true, right? Uh, Then he'll slit its throat, and he'll pour out the blood into a bowl, and then he's supposed to go to the door of his home. And watch this. And he's to put the the blood on the lentil, right, and then the doorposts. So how would he do that? He would take the blood, he would go up to the lentil, back down to the blood, left to the doorpost, and right to the doorpost. Anybody see a sign there? Any particular shape that might take? If you draw a line between the blood, what is it? It's the shape of the cross. And through that blood... The father protects his family from death, from the destroying angel that goes across the land of Egypt and strikes down all the firstborn sons. So he acts as a priest, in a sense, over his family. And they're not just supposed to use the blood of the lamb, though. The other thing that God instructs him to do is to take the flesh of the lamb and to eat it that night with unleavened bread. So notice there's both a sacrifice of blood and also a meal in which the flesh of the lamb that protects your family from death is consumed by the father and by his family. And if he does those two things, what will happen? The Lord will pass over and no plague shall fall upon them to destroy them when he smites the land of Egypt. Now this was the foundational salvific event for Israel in the Old Testament. And what Moses goes on to say is not only is this going to happen this night, But you're going to do this every single year in the spring. You're going to repeat this as an act of remembrance or or a memorial forever and ever. And every generation is going to keep doing it. Look at the next quotation here from the book of Exodus chapter 12. It continues. Moses called all the elders of Israel and he said to them, Select lambs for yourselves according to your what? Your families. So see, this is a family affair. Kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and touch the lintel on the two doorposts with the blood which is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Now you shall observe this rite as an ordinance for you and for your who? Your sons, your children, forever. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, and he slew the Egyptians, but he spared our houses. And so the people bowed their heads, and they worshipped. So notice that one point that I italicized in the middle there. What Moses imagines as a situation is that as the years go by, and they continue to remember this event, who's going to be the principal person teaching his family what it means to do this Passover rite? It's the Father. So when your children ask you, why do we do what we do every year at the Passover? You're to retell the story. You're to explain to them the significance and the meaning of the Passover lamb, that it was through the blood of the lamb and through the bread and the flesh that we ate on Passover night that we were preserved, that we were protected from death, that God passed over our people, that he saved us, and that he set us free from Egypt so that we could begin our journey to the promised land. That's how they were set free. Now, Jews did not, however, just go by the scriptures that I've just read to you. They also developed certain traditions over the centuries. And one of the things that happened with the Passover sacrifice is that as they celebrated every year, they developed a tradition of understanding that what happened during that meal was something special, that it was something spiritual, that actually had the power, in a sense, to take you back in time to that original night when God saved his people. So one of the Jewish traditions outside the Bible in a book called the Mishnah says this about when the father would would lead the Passover meal in his home. It says, quote, here's your next uh, paragraph. In every generation, a man must so regard himself as if he came forth himself out of Egypt. For it is written, quote, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Exodus 13. Therefore, we're bound to give thanks. What does that mean? What it means is that in the Jewish tradition, 
let's say 500 years have passed since Moses set the people free from Egypt, or 700 years, or even 1,000 years, or 1,200 years. Let's say you're at the time of Jesus in the first century A.D. When the father would lead the Passover meal and his child would ask, why do we do what we do tonight? His answer was always, it was because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Even though he wasn't there at the time of Moses, he didn't experience that personally. But every man, every father, every Jew was to see that original act of salvation, that original act of deliverance, that that was something that God had actually done for him. And that somehow by participating in the Passover meal at night with his family, he was in a sense going back in time to the original exodus, to the original night of deliverance. And so that he could really say, he did that for me, when he brought me out of slavery, when he brought me out of Egypt. Now that's what the Passover was like at the time of Jesus. Um, and there's so much more I could say, but I only have, I only have an hour here. Uh, thankfully, I have a book you can buy, though. Oh, messed up my joke with this paper. Who put this paper up here? All right. I got a book you can buy if you want to get more into it called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. I'll go into a lot more detail because it's really fascinating. By the time you got to the first century AD, there were all these rituals associated with the Passover lamb, like when Peter and John would go into the temple to, to, to uh, prepare the Passover. They actually had to bring the Passover lamb up to kind of like an altar rail in the temple, and they would have slit the throat of the lamb, and then they would have poured out the blood, and they would have skinned it. And they even would have put their lamb, watch this, in the first century, in order to prepare the lamb to, to roast it, the way they would do it is they'd go into the temple, they'd sacrifice the lamb, and then in the temple, the rabbis tell us that they had all these little sticks of wood so that you could skewer it, right, in order to go home and roast it. And every man had to take two sticks, and they would drive one stick through the back of the lamb down its spine, once they had skinned it, and the other one they would drive through the forearms, the forelegs of the lamb, right, across, across the breast. So they would literally crucify the lambs in the shape of a cross. And then they'd carry them out on these little crosses, and they'd go all to their homes, and every man then would roast the lamb and feed the flesh of the lamb to its family. Wow. It's almost, it's like, so if you were a Jew going up to the Passover, if you were Peter and John, for example, and you're going into Jerusalem on the night of the Last Supper, what you would have seen were thousands of men, of men, because it was the men who would do it for their families. Thousands of men. Actually, Josephus says a million people went to Judaism, uh, Jerusalem in the, in the first century for Passover. So you'd see tens of thousands of men carrying lambs in the forms of a cross on their shoulders to go home and to reenact that memorial of salvation with their families. Jesus would have saw that when he went up to the temple as a little boy. St. Joseph would have carried a little lamb on his shoulder. So what's all this about? This is a, showing us that from the beginning, God has the cross in mind. The whole thing is part of his divine plan. And the, the, the apostles as Jews, they would have understood it. They would have known it. They would have seen the shadows. They would have seen the signs. So that by the time you get to the Last Supper, they go with Jesus into the upper room, and he begins to celebrate the Passover meal with them, just like they would have done every year. But a few things are a little bit different. On the one hand, it's an ordinary Jewish Passover. It's Passover night. He's with his men. You can't have more than 20 people. He's got about 13 there, 12 disciples and himself. But a couple of things are different. Number one, notice, who acts as the father of the family in this Passover of the Last Supper? Jesus, right? He takes the lead, right? He's going to begin a new family, the family of his church. Secondly, instead of talking about this is the flesh of the Passover lamb that recalls how Moses set us free from Egypt, or this is the wine of the Passover meal that helps us remember what God did at the time of Egypt, he says something very, very, very different. Look at what he says in the account of the Last Supper. And I know you know these words, but think about it now as a Jew. And the disciples set out and they went to the city. And they found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were eating, he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take, this is my body. And then he took a cup and we had given thanks. He gave it to them and, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, surely the disciples would have been shocked by what Jesus was doing, by what Jesus was saying at the Last Supper, because no one would have ever uttered words like that at a Passover meal before. But on the other hand, precisely because they had grown up within the Jewish religion and they knew the Old Testament, and through the grace of the Holy Spirit, they would be able to recognize that what is Jesus doing at the Last Supper? It's very simple. He's revealing to them 
that he is the true Passover lamb, that he is the new Passover lamb. And just like you had to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, so too, when you come to this new meal, this new covenant banquet, what do you have to do? Can you just eat a symbol of Jesus' flesh? Can you just say, oh, I don't really like mutton, you know, I'd rather, I'll just eat something else? No, you have to receive the flesh of the lamb. And you don't just have to pour out the blood onto the exterior of your home as a sign of deliverance from death. What does he want you to do? I want you to drink it. Take this cup and drink it. So what are we going to do? Now the blood goes inside to the doorway of the heart to cover us with his blood so that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be saved from death. So what Jesus is doing at the Last Supper is mind-blowing to the first century Jews, to the, to the apostles, because he, they would have recognized that he's doing nothing less than setting in motion a new exodus. Just like the first Passover began, the first exodus from Egypt, and, and set them out on their journey to the Promised Land, so now Jesus begins a new exodus. But there's something different about the new exodus. The old exodus, remember, began in Egypt and ended in Jerusalem. It began in Egypt and it ended in the earthly promised land of Canaan. But this new exodus Jesus does begins in Jerusalem. And where is it going to end? In the heavenly kingdom, in the heavenly promised land, in the kingdom of God. You see the difference? So he's trying to get them to lift up their hearts and realize this is new exodus is vastly different as well from the first one. Okay, now let's look at the second image from the Old Testament. This is the manna from heaven. The manna from heaven. All right, if you know the story of the Exodus in the Old Testament, then you'll know that once they get out of Egypt, in other words, once they pass through the waters of the Red Sea, um, and they're set free from Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's chariots are drowned in the waters, is that the end of the story? No. Is that, do they go straight to the Promised Land? No. In fact, that's just the beginning of their journey of salvation because now they're going to enter into the desert for 40 years, 40 years of, t- of testing, 40 years of temptation, 40 years where they're being engaged with battles, like with the Amalekites who try to stop them from getting to the promised land. Uh, they'll fight serpents like in the wilderness in Numbers 21. They're going to deal with rebellions and sinfulness of the people themselves. They're going to deal with the heat and the dryness, and the thirst, and the hunger that they experience in the desert. So they're not home yet. They're just getting started. And so one of the things that happens is in Exodus chapter 16, no sooner have the people been set free from Pharaoh, no sooner have they been saved from death by the Passover, then guess what they start to do? Complain. (laughs) Good thing we're not like that, right? 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 Maybe you've had this experience, right? You, God does some amazing action in your life, right? He blesses you, right? He delivers you from some bondage, maybe to a sin. Or maybe he helps a family member reconcile. Whatever it is, whatever grace he might have uh, carried out in your life, whatever miracle you might have witnessed. How short are our memories when those things happen? A lot of times it's really easy to slip back into complaining and to just focusing on my hurts, my pains, my wants, my needs, on the earthly things of life. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. In Exodus 15, they were passed through the waters of the Red Sea. They saw God part the waters of the sea so they could get get out of slavery, they could get out of bondage. In chapter 16, they start to complain. They start to murmur against Moses. Now, if I would have been God, I would just say, Moses, step out of the way, and just struck him down. But that's not what God does, right? Because he's merciful. The Old Testament. I'm talking, I know, I'm kind of mean. I'm kind of vindictive here. Uh, but it, it, you can see this, that they test the Lord, but he doesn't respond with wrath. He responds by giving them a special gift, the gift of the manna. So here's the quote from the uh, first quote under part two from the manna from heaven. It's called the old manna, feeding your family in the desert. Listen to this passage. This is fascinating. So it says, the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. All right, pause there for a second. Notice what they're doing. 
God has set them free, but they're starting to look back, kind of like Lot's wife, right? She looks back at Sodom and Gomorrah. They're looking back to their lives when they were slaves in Egypt. And they say, well, we might have been slaves, we might have had whips on our backs, but at least our bellies were full. They long for the flesh pots of Egypt, right? Because now that they're out in the desert, there's nothing to eat. They're hungry. So notice how God responds to that complaining. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Say to them, at the twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So in the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around about the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as hoarfrost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another in Hebrew, Manhu, Manhu, what is it? What is this stuff? For they did not know what it was. They'd never seen anything like it before. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Now the house of Israel called its name Mana, just like you heard Manhu, it's like a pun. Mana. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And the people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the land on the border of Canaan. Exodus chapter 16. Whew, so much to talk about here. There's a lot going on. Let me just try to break down a few key points. Number one, what does God give to his people when they're being tested in the desert? He gives them miraculous bread from heaven. That's the first point. Miraculous bread from heaven. Number two, it isn't just a miracle of bread. Sometimes people miss this. But when you go back to the manna, notice it's a twofold miracle. In the morning, they have bread from heaven. But in the evening, they have flesh from heaven. So every day, morning, evening, morning, evening, bread and flesh, bread and flesh. Bread, is this sounding familiar, Catholics? Bread and flesh yeah, from heaven. Yeah, you get the idea. Okay. So he's providing for them, right? Uh, third, notice, when did it come in the morning? It came with the, the dew. I can't help but point this out, but you might have noticed in the new translation of the Mass that came out a few years ago, they made this very clear when the priest calls down the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in the Eucharistic prayer, what does he say at the Epiclesis? Send your spirit down upon these gifts like the dewfall. That's right, like the dewfall. Have you ever wondered... Why, why are we talking about dew in the middle of church? <laughs> like, what, what does that have to do with anything? No pun intended. That was actually good, yeah. What does that have to do with anything? Um, it just came to me. I'm going to put that, write that down. <laughs> People laughed, seemed to work. Note to self. All right, okay, good. Well, I'll tell you what it has to do. It's an echo of the, of, the, of the manna. See, the church, remember, we might not know that the Eucharist and the manna are tied to one another, but the church knows. She remembers. And she gives that to us in the Mass, right? Our daily bread. Uh, uh, third point, or fourth point, I don't remember how many uh, I said so far. Notice what they say. When they see the bread that comes with the dew, they don't know what it is. And so they say, man who? What is it? What is this bread? Now, one of the reasons that's important for us to point out is because the Israelites uh, knew the wilderness. In fact, Moses had spent 40 years in the wilderness. So he knew what the Sinai wilderness was like, but they'd never seen anything like this before. Why? Because it was a miracle. Because it's a supernatural act of God. I have to bring this up because sometimes in our contemporary context, in the modern world, where people have grown very, very skeptical of miracles, sometimes certain commentators or scholars will try to say, oh, well, what this really was was not miraculous bread from heaven, but it was, a, it was actually a, a secretion of a bug that lives in the Sinai Desert. Um, I forget the exact kind of bug. Oh, on the tamarisk plant. There's these bugs, and sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll secrete this little substance, and it's like a little white substance. And you could consume it, although would you want to, right? Uh, 
Uh, anybody remember snake spit when you were kids? That's what we used to call it. The, these bugs would put out this little secretion on the plants. We called it snake spit. It was something like that. And so people, scholars would say, oh, well, that's just this ancient bug. Well, not an ancient bug. It's actually a modern bug that would secrete this stuff, and they ate it, and they, they thought it was miraculous. Well, that doesn't make any sense for two reasons. First, they've never seen it before, and they would have known what that was. Secondly, as the book of Exodus goes on to say, the manna would only appear six days of the week. They could go out six days of the week and gather it, but on the sixth day they had to gather twice as much because the seventh day it wouldn't appear. So if you want to say it was, a, it was bug goo, <laughs> then you have to have posited an even greater miracle, namely that even the bugs observe the Sabbath. So I'm going to go with the miraculous interpretation because it makes a little more sense to me than the Sabbath bugs. But anyway, the point, though, is uh, that this miraculous bread, and and actually Exodus tells us that um, if some people would gather a lot, they would only get one omer. And if some people gathered too little, they would get an omer too. In other words, every single person got what they needed and what the Lord provided for them. Okay, This is miraculous. It gives them just what they need to survive. Um, and so they said, what is it? They call it the what is it bread. Right? And you know what? That question still echoes down through the millennia. Thousands of thousands of years, people are still asking that question. What is it? What is this bread? And the way you answer that question, my brothers, will determine the way you live every single day of your life. Is it just bread? Or is it a miraculous gift from heaven? Because those are two very different things. And if it is a miraculous gift from heaven, that's going to change the way I live. It's going to change how I orient my life. It's going to change how I lead my family and how I live as a man of God. So it says, the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like coriander seeds, and it was white, and the taste was like wafers made with honey. Huh, interesting. Wafers. Wafers. Like wafers made with honey. Why does it taste like honey? Well, in a first century context, or even in the context of the book of Exodus, it would have made a lot of sense because, remember, they've begun a journey, they're out of Egypt, and now they're on their way to the land flowing with milk and... And honey, yeah, that's the promised land. So in other words, the manna isn't just a provision for the people while they're in the desert. It's also got a little foretaste of the promised land. It's a little taste of what's to come. It's a pledge to God's people where he's telling them, look, I know you're tired now. I know you're hot. I know you're hungry. I know you're grumbling. I know it looks like I'm, it might look like I'm not really with you right now, but I promise you, if you are faithful, I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. And as a promise of that, as a pledge, I'm going to give you a little bit of a foretaste in this, this wafer, this what is it bread, this manna. The final thing about this that tells us it was a miracle was it says that the people ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. In other words, it was a temporary phenomenon. It only lasted from when they got out of Egypt, 40 years, and then once they get to the promised land, the miracle stops. Because now that they're in the land of milk and honey, they don't need the foretaste anymore. Okay, so now that you've been to Jewish uh, CCD on uh, on the manna, you can now understand more in a deeper way Jesus' teachings about the Eucharist in John chapter 6. Now, I could, do, I could probably do a two-day seminar just, just on John 6, but we don't have that kind of time. So I just want to highlight one aspect of this next quotation here. John 6 is where Jesus gives his famous discourse on the bread of life. And in my own life, this passage is, is, is the most important passage in the Bible for me personally because it's the one that got me into the study of sacred scripture. When I was a, a young man in college, I was going to LSU actually, uh, my wife and I got engaged in our freshman year or junior year? I can't, no, no, sophomore year. Um, and we were going to meet with her pastor. She had grown a Baptist. And we were going to meet with her pastor to talk about our preparations for the wedding. And we were just supposed to talk to him for about 15 minutes. And we went into his office. And he was this fiery Southern Baptist preacher from, from South Texas. Okay? And um, I had met Louisiana Baptists, you know, Cajun Baptists, but they were all pretty nice. 
But this guy was really, really, really anti-Catholic. And um, we were supposed to leave in 15 minutes. It ended up being a two and a half hour theological back and forth, a wrestling match. And I'm, and I'm ashamed to say uh, I lost terribly. He, he, just, he just blasted me. Question after question. Why do you worship statues? Why do you worship Mary? You know, don't you know the Pope isn't infallible? He's a man. Only Jesus is sinless. I mean, he just went on down the line, down the line, down the line, down the line. And then the final one he attacked was the Eucharist. How can you say that it's the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ? Don't you know that if you ate Jesus' flesh and drank his blood, that would be cannibalism? And that if you ate his flesh and drank his blood, you would become Jesus? Now, if I'd have known better, I'd have said, yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> yeah. Abide in me, right? I'm the vine, you're the brand. Yes, I want to become Jesus. I want to be a part of his body, right? The church. But at the time, it just hurt me. It just upset me. and I didn't know what to say. So I went home that night, and I was pretty upset. So I opened up my confirmation Bible that my parents had bought for me. It's a beautiful leather-bound Bible. <laughs> Blew the dust off, right? You know? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I was already reading my Bible, but... Um, but I, I, I didn't have an answer to that question. And I opened my Bible up to these words that I'm reading to you. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Look what he does. Watch this. Your fathers ate what in the wilderness? The manna. And they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man might eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, oh, Paul's there. I, I, let me just say this. That's a good question, right? I mean... If you grew up Catholic like I did, I'm a cradle Catholic. If you grew up Catholic, you grew up hearing those words, we receive, this is the body and this is the blood of Christ. And it's kind of ordinary to you. But just try to put yourself in their shoes for a second. You're going to synagogue, it's Friday night, you're bringing your family out. Hey, there's this preacher from Galilee. It's Joseph's boy, you know, he's going to be talking tonight. So he gets up on the, on the, uh, you know, in the synagogue, he sits down at the uh, seat of Moses to start to explain the, the reading. And he says... The bread I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. And you have to eat it. What would you think? <laughs> right? This guy's off his rocker, right? It's a little crazy, right? I mean, what's he saying? Here, you take a finger, you take a toe. This part's real good and on the arm. He's talking about cannibalizing his corpse. What would that have meant to them? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, I was only speaking metaphorically. Are you looking at your handbook? It doesn't say that. Okay. No. Amen, amen, I say to you, watch, he ratchets it up. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. Not such as the fathers ate and died, i.e. the manna. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Right? It's offensive to their ears to hear him saying this. So... In fact, as, as the story goes on to tell us, many of his disciples at this point left him and no longer went about with him. So Jesus turns to Peter and the twelve and he says, do, do you guys want to go away too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. What is Peter saying? He's saying, Lord, I, I don't comprehend what you just said. I can't fathom it. I can't figure it out. But I know who you are, and I know that your word is truth. And I'm going to accept that truth by faith. And I'm going to follow you, because you have the words of eternal life. And that's the right response from Peter. It's a response of supernatural faith. Of a faith in the truth of his word that goes beyond things that we can fully comprehend or fully explain. And yet, at the same time, I would stress for you, my brothers, that 
Jesus gives them a clue to help them understand the mystery of the Eucharist when he begins and he ends his statements here about the flesh and blood by pointing back to the manna in the Old Testament. Why does he start by referring to the manna and then end by referring to the manna when he gives his most explicit teaching on the real presence in the Eucharist? I would suggest to you that the answer is this. Because as first century Jews, the disciples would have known that the manna in the Old Testament was miraculous bread from heaven. And therefore, if the Old... Hear hear this, this is very important. If the Old Testament manna is miraculous bread from heaven, can the New Testament manna just be a symbol? Just be a sign and not a miracle? No, because that would make the old manna greater than the new manna. And that's not how typology works in the Bible. The Old Testament prefigurations are never greater than their fulfillments, right? Adam was a type of Christ. Who was greater, Adam or Jesus? Say Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, thank you. Okay. David was a type of Christ. Who's greater? Christ, Jesus, right? I mean, remember the little incident with Bathsheba, right? Um, whose, whose parents should have named her don't take a bath, Sheba, because, that, ah, yeah, that's good, huh? I made that up the other day. I thought I'd try it out this morning. Okay. Don't take a bath, Sheba, because she took a bath. And, anyway, you, you get it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, where, where was I? I lost the ball. got lost in the weeds there. Uh, oh, yeah, typology. Okay. So Solomon points forward to Jesus, right? But he's not greater than Christ. So the same thing's true with the manna. The manna, miraculous bread from heaven, points forward to the Eucharist. Jesus is saying that right here. But the old's not greater than the new. So if the old is miraculous bread from heaven, then the new also has to be miraculous bread from from heaven. It's real food. It's real drink. It's really his flesh. It's really his blood. But in a glorified state, the resurrected Christ coming to us. Not just, oh, by the way, not just once a week either. How often did they eat the manna? Every day. Every day. Isn't that interesting? So many different denominations will celebrate the Lord's Supper or they'll celebrate memorials of the Last Supper. Some will do it once a year. Some will do it four times a year. Some will do it maybe even every Sunday. But who is it? Which church is it that does it every single day? The Catholic Church does it. Why? Why are we so fixated on the Eucharist? Because it is the new manna from heaven. It's the food of eternal life. How often do you eat your regular food? Once a week? I don't think so. Especially not in South Louisiana, right? No, every single day. So thanks be to God for all of those of you here who are priests for feeding your family every day. Amen, brothers? Can we thank them right now? Thank you, fathers. All of you out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Because that's what a man does. That's what a father does. He feeds his family every single day. And so if the Eucharist then is what Jesus is revealing to us, two things follow. He's the true manna from heaven. And if you want to feed your family, what do you need to do? You need to bring them to the Eucharist. And if you can't do it every day, do it as often as you can. But you certainly need to bring them every Lord's Day, every Sunday, to give them the supernatural food that they need. Because you know as well as I do that you and your families are in the desert. We're not in a promised land yet, right? We've been set free from Egypt. We've, been, we've passed through the waters of baptism. But we're not home yet. So we better take strength in the true gift of Jesus from heaven. All right, I'm, 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 I, can't, I love the man. I, I'm getting off time here. So let me keep going here. Third image from the Old Testament um, that I want to share with you is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, most of you have seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? So I don't have to tell you about the Ark all that much. Uh, But I do want to hit a few points about it. The Ark was, of course, the special dwelling place of God with his people in Israel. And in the book of Exodus chapter 25, after uh, they received the Ten Commandments from God, the next thing God tells them is how he wants to be worshipped. And the first thing he does is command them to build an Ark, a golden box, that he describes like this. Listen to these words. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length. A cubit and a half shall be its breadth. A cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with what? Pure gold. You shall put poles in the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark by them. 
You shall put the, in the ark the testimony. That means the Ten Commandments, the two tablets, which I will give you. Then you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, and you shall make two cherubim, those are angels, of gold. Of hammer work you shall make them, and on the two ends of the mercy seat. And there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat I will speak to you of all that I give in commandment for the people of Israel. So pause here. Notice what he's describing. He's saying this golden box is going to be the place that houses my word. You're going to put the word of God into the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be covered, note this, in gold and statues, my brother. So God is not anti-gold and he's not anti-statue. I'm just throwing that out there, okay? Sometimes say Catholics, you know, why do you have statues in your churches? Why do you have the gold in your churches? Because that's how God likes it. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> that's how he likes it. No, he knows we need symbols and signs to show us that when we come into the church, we're not on earth anymore. We're in heaven. And gold is always a symbol of heaven. So he tells them to make this art, and he says, in the ark, I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to speak with you there. That's going to be the place of my presence. And guess where they put the Ark of the Covenant? In all crazy places, they put it in the tabernacle, the sanctuary, all the way in the back, up at the top. Sound familiar? (laughs) Right? The special dwelling place of God went in the innermost sanctum of 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 the tabernacle. Now, if you look at the next quote, next question we want to ask is, well, what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the New Testament reveals that there were three things inside the ark. It says this. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the Holy of Holies. And in it stood the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. In which there were, number one, a golden golden urn holding what? The manna. Number two, Aaron's rod that budded. You might not know about that, but in the book of Numbers... It was, uh, there was a fight between the 12 tribes over who were the real priests. And so God told them, show up in the morning, put your staffs for each of you tribes on the ground, lay, or actually lay them out overnight, and in the morning come out and you'll see. And the staff that buds with blossoms, that's the true priesthood. That's the tribe that has it. So they lay it out, and in the morning they come in, and Aaron's dead wood, the dead wood of his staff, has blossomed, has budded. And so what does it show? That Aaron is the true priest. And also, too, by the way, my brothers, it's a, that's a sign of the cross. See, Jesus is going to take the dead wood of the cross, and he's going to make it spring to life. The cross is going to become the tree of life that gives life to the people through his priesthood, through his sacrament. So the word of God, on the, I'm sorry, the manna and the urn, number two, the staff of Aaron, the wood, and then number three, the tablets of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So in other words, inside the ark, you had the word of God, you had the bread of heaven, and you had the priesthood of God, the sign of the priesthood. So as the Israelites are journeying through the desert, the way they know which way to go, the way they discern how to travel is they follow the ark. Wherever the ark goes, that's where they go. If they want to commune with God, they stick with the ark. God meets them. He talks to them in the ark. He comes down in the glory cloud on top of the ark. And he leads them step by step, stage by stage, all the way to the promised land. And on the journey, they have lots of temptations. They have lots of trials. They have lots of battles. In fact, they get into battles with certain people. And at one point, sorry, several occasions when they get into a battle, as long as they bring the ark into the battle, guess what happens? They win. That's why Hitler wanted it in Indiana Jones, all right? If you watch, no, that's, that was the whole premise of the movie, was that Hitler knew the Bible better than most Catholics, right? He knew that if he got the ark, he could defeat everyone. So where do you get that idea? Well, it's from Numbers. So look at the book of Numbers here, chapter 14. It says, the danger of going into battle without the ark. It says, they, Israel, presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, even though the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses had not left the camp. So what happened? The Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and whooped them, defeated them, pursuing them as far as Hormah. So, what's the moral of the story? You're going to do battle with your enemies. You better go with the ark. Don't try to do it on your own strength. You need the ark. You need the presence of God. You need the power of the manna. You need the power of the priesthood. You need the power of the word of God. That's the only way you will defeat the spiritual enemies that you're going to have to face while you're in the desert on the way to the promised land. And the only way you can actually even make it into the promised land 
is if you're with the Ark of the Covenant. Look at the next quote. This is from the book of Joshua, one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, because it describes their coming into the, uh, the promised land. And it's one of the most manly books in the Old Testament because it's all about battles. All about battles, right? Some people say, why is the Old Testament so violent? Why is there so much war in it? I said, easy. So that guys would be interested in the Bible. <laughs> it's real simple. God knew he needed to put some battles in there if he's going to get men interested in reading the thing, right? Unfortunately, we don't read the Old Testament as much as we should. So listen to what it says here. Early in the morning, Joshua rose and set out with all the Israelites, and they came to the Jordan River. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by who? The priests. The priests lead them. Then you shall set out from your place. Follow the Ark, so that you may know the way you should go. For you have not passed this way before. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, a distance of about 2,000 cubits. Don't come any nearer to the ark. This is, by the way, this is why Catholics sit in the back. Right now, like, ark's up there, I'm sticking in the back, all right? <laughs> Jewish roots of sitting in the back of the pew. That's, that's right there, okay. <laughs> then Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And then to the priests he said, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on in front of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went in front of the people. And when the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan River, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in the front. So they lead the way. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. So when those who brought the Ark, bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water... The waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city beside Zarethan, while those flowing toward the Sea of Arabah, which is the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were wholly cut off, right? So it, the water forms a wall on two sides. Have we seen this before? Yeah, it's Moses in the Red Sea. So the same thing happens now at the end of the Exodus. They part the waters, and then it says, Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And while all Israel were crossing over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on the dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. So, in other words, what does this mean? It means that the Ark of the Covenant was the mechanism by which God not only uh, dwelt with his people, but it's what finally gets them home to the Promised Land. It's what passes through the waters of the Jordan River so that they can enter into the land flowing with milk and honey. So what does that mean for us in the New Testament? How does that work typologically? I just want to show you something real quick. I don't have time to do this in full. That wasn't supposed to happen. (laughs) I always spill. My kids kids have this joke, actually. I spill every single day in all kinds of ways, and this one's going to go down as a good spill, so I just spill water everywhere. All right. Um, I have a CD set called Mother of the Messiah, where I try to show you that Mary is the fulfillment of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, And I don't have time to get through it right now, but if you look at the New Testament, you'll see the parallels real clearly. But you can actually pick it up if you think about it in this way. When Mary conceived Jesus within her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit, what came to dwell in her body? The bread from heaven, the word made flesh, and the true priesthood of God. That's why the ancient Christians always said that the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament was a sign and a shadow of of Mary. Because Mary became the dwelling place of the Lord, not just in a box in spirit, but in the flesh. So, if Mary's the Ark and Jesus is the manna, and you and I want to make it to the promised land, if we want to bring our families home, and I assume that's what you all want to do, right? Every man wants to protect his family from danger and death. Every man wants to feed his family. And every man, ultimately, I assume you want to be with them forever in heaven, right? Amen? Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to follow the ark. We need to stay close to the manna. We need to lean on the priesthood, and we need to learn the Word of God. And if we do that faithfully, and if we eat the food of the bread of heaven every day, if we receive that gift of the manna, and we stay close to Jesus in the ark, guess what? One day, one day, 
will cross through the River Jordan. Not to the earthly promised land, but to the heavenly land. And we'll bring our families with us, God willing. Because that's God's vocation for us as men. And look, you might be thinking, well, I don't have any children yet, or I don't have any children at all. Well, that's, you, every one of us has some extended family who need our prayers, who need our intercession, who need us to be a witness to them. So every man has that, that warrior in him who wants to go on a journey, who wants to go on an adventure, who wants to fight a battle, and who wants to have victory and make it home. That's what the whole story of the Exodus is all about. That's what it's all about. And at the center of that story, over and over and over again, is the bread, is the Eucharist is the golden box where God dwells with us and then leading us home. So if you want to make it home to the promised land, stay close to the ark, stay close to Mary, stay close to the Eucharist, and stay close to the tabernacle. In conclusion then, what can we do now? If the Eucharist is the new manna, the new Passover, the new ark of the covenant, the new bread of the presence, what do we do? Let's listen to the words of St. Paul in closing. St. Paul said this about Christ, our Passover lamb. First point. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Here he's talking about the leaven at Passover. So a leaven is uh, yeast, right? So during Passover, they wouldn't use any kind of bread. They would use unleavened bread because it's a leaven as unclean, right? So you had to use unleavened bread, just like we do in the Eucharist, in making the Passover. So he says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You put a little yeast in, the whole thing rises. So cleanse out the old leaven so that you might be a new lump, as you really are unleavened bread. Why? For Christ, our Passover lamb, Greek, Pascha, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore keep the feast, not with the old leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what Paul's saying here is, if you were a Jew and you were going to prepare to celebrate the Passover, you had to get unleavened bread and you had to clean out the old bread, clean out the leaven, clean out the uncleanness. So what do we need to do as men? First things first, confession. Confession. If you got leaven in your, in your life, if you got something unclean or impure, you need to clean it out so you can prepare, so you can, as St. Paul says, keep the feast of Christ our Passover who has been sacrificed for us. And that's how we do that. See, the bread was a symbol of us and the leaven was a symbol of sin and impurity. So we want to clean it out so we can have the unleavened bread of the Holy Eucharist. Second, we want to make the Eucharist the source and the summit of our lives. We want to make it the center of our lives as Christians. And the Catechism says that. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. All the other sacraments, indeed all the ecclesial ministries and works of the Apostle, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward the Eucharist. For in it is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, which is Christ himself, our Passover, our Pasch. What does that mean? It means that for us as Catholics, if what we said at the beginning of the talk is true, if the Eucharist is really Jesus' body, his blood, his soul, and his divinity, that means that the Eucharist is not just something. The Eucharist is someone. The Eucharist is someone. That's why it's so important to us. That's why we put it at the center, because it isn't an it. It is a he, our Lord, our Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then third and final, I just encourage you, my brothers, too, that you, that you continue to grow. Whatever happens here today in you spiritually, whatever God's saying to you, and I know you're all in different places, and everybody's coming from different places, wherever you're at spiritually right now, whatever God says to you today, don't let it stay here today. Don't let it just stop with today. Continue to pray, continue to study, continue to follow the ark, to stay close to the manna, to stay close to the Passover lamb, to lead your family. Be the priest of your family in the home, just like the Jews, and lead them home to the promised land. And one great way you can do that is by helping me provide for my family, by buying CDs and books. No. <laughs> See how I wove that in? It was pretty good. Transition, huh? No, seriously, we've got a lot of resources here. You're going to be here throughout the day. And I just want to encourage you, if you like to read, we've got books. We've got books. Um, I've got books on the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. If you enjoyed the talk today, check it out. I've got another one on the case for Jesus. I didn't bring it up here with me. Oh, there it is. Um, some of you might be thinking, man, my, my family's, my young, my, my children have left the church. They don't even go to Mass anymore. I don't even think they believe in Jesus anymore. My son tells me he's an atheist. What do I do with that? I don't know how to respond to that. That's why I wrote this book called The Case for Jesus. 
because it's going back to square one. I've noticed more and more there are young people today, Catholics, who are saying, I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I don't believe. I don't believe in the Eucharist. I don't even believe in Jesus anymore. So what do you do? What do you say? I've got books. I've got audio versions of this too if they don't like to read. Get some resources. Study yourself, but also share them with others. It's a great way to help others on the journey. And hey, you might say, well, look, I'm not a bookworm. Well, maybe you're a tapeworm then. So, <laughs> so if you like to listen, man, we got all kinds of CDs. We got apologetic CDs, Origin of the Bible, Mary in Sacred Scripture. I've got this t- similar version of what I just gave you, the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, that talk. We got them on CD. We got them on DVD. Um, we got, what about spiritual life? Maybe you're like, oh, I've got this apologetic stuff, but I want to go deeper into my life of prayer. I want to learn how to pray more. Um, one of the things I've done that's really been, uh, meant a lot to me is put out a number of studies on the spiritual life. Abraham and the spiritual life. Peter and the spiritual life. I've got one on the temptations of Jesus and Lent. Lent's coming, guys. It's coming. I don't know about you, but I always get scared. Like, oh man, here it comes again. Uh, so how can I dive into Lent? How can I dive into my life of prayer? This is my favorite set I've ever done. It's called Spiritual Theology. Christian Prayer and the Stages of the Spiritual Life. Whatever your interest might be, Bible study, apologetics, spirituality, I know that not just my table, but all, there are other tables and resources there. You guys have a feast, not just the Eucharistic feast we're going to have today, but a feast of the Word of God if you want it. If you, so if you're hungry, go eat it, get you some, and then don't just keep it to yourself. Give it to your wife, give it to your children, give it to your family and your friends, and go out there and be a warrior for Jesus Christ. And let's get all, everyone, help each other get home to the promised land. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, true Passover lamb, true bread from heaven, bread of the presence, word made flesh. Thank you for coming to be with us today. Thank you for being right here with us in the blessed sacrament as we ponder your word, as we ponder the mystery of the Eucharist, as we ponder your real presence, and we ponder your vocation to us as men to be warriors, to fight the battles that will get our families and our friends and our loved ones home. We pray that everything you want to teach us this day would just write it into our hearts and burst them open with grace and peace, repentance, and freedom. And we give you glory, Lord, and we thank you for all these gifts as we say. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank y'all so much, guys. Thank y'all.